Well, again, welcome to the church. We're so grateful to have you here with us at Hope Crossing and be able to spend time now together in the Word of God. Uh, we're going to spend the next um, 17 hours together here, so uh, hopefully you are hydrated and ready to go uh, in our time together in the Word, because that's what it's going to take to get through Daniel chapter 1, I was going to tell you. All right. No, uh, the book of Daniel we are going through now. Uh, we're going to begin uh, a series today called uh, The Lions, the Fire, and the Faithfulness of God. And um, over the next several weeks, we're going to be exploring verse by verse the book of Daniel. It's going to be a really special time as we encounter God's truth. And the reason why we're going through this uh, book together is because Daniel, along with some other young friends, um, grew up in community together. They grew up doing life together in Israel. And they were God's people, and they learned God's ways. They were a, a thriving part of the community in which they lived. But as young adult, adults, they found themselves taken away, living as exiles, as foreigners in a land that they didn't belong to. And they found, more importantly, that the people they were now living shoulder to shoulder with did not live by the same ways and standards and desires that they did. And so the book of Daniel follows Daniel and his friends as they try to figure out how to navigate this new reality of being the fringe minority when they were once a part of the cultural and spiritual majority in their own world and context. Let's pray. God, thank you for today and thank you for the chance we have this day to be able to spend time together in your word. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts as we seek your truth. Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart that desires to obey your truth as we dare to be all that you desire for us to be. We love you, Father, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> right now, we are living in a time in history that has a new cultural movement within it. Within the last few decades here in America, the ground beneath our feet and within our daily lives has shifted. And it started long before we even began to talk about Daniel as a church family. America was once a very Christianized culture with Christian values and principles that carried over into every aspect of life, work, home, school, the neighborhood, in personal life as well as in community. And that was the norm. But then the ground shifted in America. Culture within America became Christianized, but also mixed with values of the world and values of man. And over the recent years, culture has shifted into a deeper place, operating in what social critics call post-Christian culture. Now, we begin to see a bit in our 2019 year a change among a younger generation of people coming out of a post-culture, post-Christian culture, and for the first time in many years, really pursuing a desire with God and a holiness of God that is unique and different than previous generations. But what we're living in, the reality that we're living in here, is, um, is a time in which this post-Christian culture, where being a Christian or, or a real follower, a real disciple of Christ, is not always um, accepted. It's kind of maybe even pressured to look uh, and conform to be something that it's not meant to be. But the reality is, is Christianity is not going to go away. Following God, faith in God, Yahweh, it's not going to go away. Even though it's been placed below, cultural Christianity even looks at us and says, yeah, you have faith and values that govern your choices, but God is the king. He is Lord over all of creation. And we are once again seeking to see Jesus as the crucified and resurrected King and Savior in this place, in our homes, and in our lives. So although we are Christians, our Christ followers, many of us, and we find ourselves in a similar circumstance to Daniel, strangers in a foreign land, the culture at large might see what we do as we pursue God and even gather in worship or seek to live by holy ways as strange or weird. They might think of our beliefs, for example, um, that God made sex as a gift for man and woman in marriage to enjoy, and to separate it from that, we believe is damaging to the human experience, and we believe has a profound effect, effect on the family. 
Not only that, we also believe it to be absolute rebellion against God's holy standards. So the world might see that core belief that we believe about marriage and, and about the way in which the family is to be, they might view it as strange. They might view it as intolerant or old school or fuddy-duddy. They believe, and I can say that they believe this to the point that the last season of a very popular show on television, The Bachelor, featured this 20-something virgin. And they paint the picture that him being a virgin was actually a problem. What man who played professional sports would still be a virgin? What's wrong with him? What kind of issues does he have in his life? Now, I don't know him personally, and I definitely don't know what his belief in God is. But again and again, it was painted scene after scene, episode after episode, as it being this barrier, this bizarreness to him. That he hadn't gone out and had lots of relationships with lots of other girls and experimented and experienced in life. They painted it as a problem, but they thought it was worthy of reality TV. People in awe that one might not just go along with the watching world is what they saw. So we are in Daniel because Daniel is going to be really helpful in teaching us how to respond to this new cultural moment. I want to encourage you with uh, turn with me this morning to your book uh, in your Bible to the book of Daniel. Uh, it is in the Old Testament there. And we're going to be going through verse one today and learn together how we can dare to be all that God wants us to be, to be like Daniel, to pursue God, and to live without compromise. God's calling on our lives to be distinct and to be set apart. You know, in many different situations, cultures and, and countries even, there are different cultural norms, what's appropriate. For example, you're never supposed to touch a person's head in Thailand because they view that part of their body as um, sacred and holy. It's a, a sacred part of them. And in Portugal, uh, you can't write anything in red ink. It's offensive in red ink. Um, in some Asian countries, you can't show the bottom of your foot. That That is a bad thing. And some cultures don't like their photo being taken. They feel that it could Pull away one's soul. Chewing gum in Singapore is illegal because it's litter and it's found on the ground and you can't chew gum in the country, which I don't know why, but it makes me want to visit Singapore with a huge backpack of gum and liberate those people. <laughs> but that would be offensive. It's against the law. It would be hurtful. Because different countries, different cultures, even within the same country, have different things that are very acceptable. There are parts of our world that live in a time frame that's much different than in the way in which we live typically in North America. We live moment by moment, nine to five. Other countries live experience from experience. The party doesn't start until everybody arrives. We live in different settings, different places, and those things in and of themselves aren't wrong. But what Daniel shows us is how to live without compromise in a world that tries to take away from what God has called us to do. So let's look together at verses 1 through 5 as disciples of Christ, knowing that we will face some of the more, some of the same, very same pressures to our faith that Daniel has, but we'll learn from him this illustration of how we can live for God uh, in the world in which we live in. And we'll look specifically in these first five verses, this reminder for us of how we need to always look to God alone. Verse 1, in the year of the reign of King, the reign of uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and brought the vessels into the treasury of the, his God, lowercase g. Then the king ordered um, Ashpenaz, the chief of the officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and some of the nobles, youth in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and whose abilities were serving the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he had drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years at the end of which they would enter the king's personal service. Now, I don't know about yours. My, my Bible has pictures, and when it's describing these young men, there's actually a picture of me. 
uh, there. <laughs> that handsome part. Okay, no, okay. Um, but what we see in these verses is this idea of looking to God alone. We have to realize a lot has happened in these five verses. Uh, the country is besieged. Your home has been taken captive. Now, these were the people distinct by God. And so the historical context that we get from this is really awful. <laughs> the king of Judah had failed. The king of Israel had failed. He had led his people into an experience period of decline. In fact, he had failed to worship God the right way. He had failed to worship God the right way. And so in 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar attacks and carries off some of the most prized possessions. And the theological implication and context behind this is at the beginning of verse 2 where it says the Lord handed him over. It says he gave him over to the enemy. So it's a pretty tough opening here in these first few verses. What had been was no longer going to be. We know this, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but Daniel would serve for 70 years in Babylon. 70 years. There he would serve. The consequence lived out in this it was God's people, it was God's city, it was attacked. And this was an all-out low point in the life of God's people. And so did God have a, play, a, a part in orchestrating this? Was he complicit in this circumstance? What's really happening here in these first few verses that we read is that God was making good on a promise from long ago when he said that if my people did not obey me, they would be defeated. By their enemies. And now God is allowing this to happen. And it gets kind of worse. Not only are they defeated, but he takes the best and the brightest from the land. Again, a picture of me in your Bibles. Best and brightest, okay? It's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. But the intent here is very strategic. The king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he desires to strip these people of all of their best and their brightest to try to take from their ranks that which might come up underneath and try to redeem the situation and take them into his captivity and to make sure that they serve him and become a part of his feelings, thoughts, and tradition. What he does is he's very strategic. He thinks this will make all of Israel captive to him, submit to him for generations to come. He will indoctrinate them. He will assimilate them into the life of a Babylonian. And so what these first five verses really look to us and remind us to do is to look for God's sovereign hand during our suffering. Because this is how we must understand suffering, by looking at the suffering. We see something bad on television, and what do we want to do? Turn away, change the channel. It's too harsh a reality, but it happened. It's there. The reality is, is that God is at work. He is sovereign and he is holy, even in the messy stuff, even in the hard stuff. And as Christ followers, as we look to him alone, we are to look for his hand, his sovereign hand at work, even during suffering. Because even though sin might have led us to a difficult situation, we can look to God and his goodness and his sovereignty despite our failure. We can trust that he has not utterly abandoned us. We can examine ourselves, we can repent of our sins, and choose to walk from that time forward in obedience to God's command. Because the temptation to let go of God is stronger when we suffer. But we must hold fast to him, especially in our suffering, and let him work all things for his good, his good in our lives. Amen. Now let's look at verses 6 and 7 together, where we are reminded what to seek alone. <clears throat> it says, Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. <coughs> Excuse me. And to, the new, and to Daniel he assigned the name uh, Belshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Meshach, and to Michelle Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. 
So here we have this unique experience in which we need to understand what it means to have seek God alone. And this is during this time of history. The context, again, is assimilation. And what does he do? He takes their God-given Hebrew names, and he gives them new names. <laughs> new names. Now, unless your name was really bad, and we don't really know what the jokes were back then about some of these names, because they're kind of just hard to pronounce already, aren't they? So we don't know if somebody got teased for calling some of those Michelle or Michelle or whatever. But we do know that those were their God-given names. Those were the names their parents gave them. And here they are having to assimilate to the culture in which they live, and they're being told, you will no longer be called who you are, that it has defined you, that it has marked you as a son of Judah, that it is no longer your name, rather you're going to be called this. And it's going to identify you with this new way of life. This is what they were trying to do to assimilate them. So this is the situation. Basically a teenager, a young adult, he and several of his friends are abducted by a hostile enemy power. And they're told, conform. <clears throat> they're told, let go of what you have. Be a part of what we are. They not only uh, decided to assimilate them, but they tried to isolate them as well. And during this period of isolation and indoctrination, this strategy to erase their ties to their former of life, they had to seek God alone. They were those people that had not been familiar any longer. They no longer got to in enter their temple with praise. But had to create a temple in the place in which they lived. They no longer got to do the things that they formerly knew to do. They were being told, leave all of that behind and turn to this. Assimilate as they were isolated, as they were indoctrinated. And often, if we're honest, Satan seeks to do the exact same thing to us. He seeks to isolate you from other believers. He seeks to in indoctrinate your heart and say just a little bit of that temptation, just a little bit of that sin is okay. You're not really involved in it too much. It's okay to have a little bit of the world in your life as long as you've got a little bit more Jesus going on in your life. And that period of assimilation to the ways of the world in which we live often isolate us and indoctrinate us into the things opposite of God's heart for our lives. We can't be this way. What shall we seek in those times? What shall we seek? Well, if you go back one verse to verse 5, it's about seeking something for someone else. It's about seeking the good for those around you. Being holy during suffering and pain often means seeking the good of others, taking your eyes off of your own experience and praying for blessing and encouraging those around you. When we're suffering, it's so easy to be inward in our focus and in our pursuits because of our own pain, because of our own hurt, because of our own need. We can forget the needs around us, even when they are greater than our own. But God, he desires to use us for his glory and his good to those around us who are also suffering. Because what was happening in the life of Daniel was being watched by everyone and everyone on both sides. How they responded to this mattered to thousands of people. How they responded to the suffering in their lives and the question for you to consider is, are you letting God use you during such times? During your suffering, during your hardship, during your pain. Now let's look at verses 8 through 21 together, where we see how Daniel and his friends respond to this moment and are reminded to be faithful to God alone. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? 
Then you would uh, make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence, and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter, and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and wine uh, they were to drink, and kept giving them vegetables. As for these four youth, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days, the king had specified presenting them. The commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, uh, out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for matters of wisdom and understanding about the king, he consulted them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all the realm. And Daniel continued to be until the first year of Cyrus the king. Again, a period of seven years. So obviously the king has some sort of special food that he sets aside. Something there. And, and really, again, this is part of the isolation part. He's got something better than the remainder of the world or the rest of the world has. Something better than the oppressed people definitely will have. And he wants to entice them. Like, you're good enough. I, I value you. You have enough value to me that I'm going to give you some of my best. Now, who wouldn't that entice? Especially if you're hungry or if needy. But here in this moment, again, these verses contain so much information. That it's hard to really unpack all of it or understand the time frame behind it. But it, there's a, a strong possibility that Daniel is very aware of the reality of why Israel fell. And it wasn't just about the food maybe that was being given considered unclean according to Hebrew law. But maybe there was something more going on. Maybe there was something more than just good food or bad food. What we know is that Daniel determined to take a stand. Take a stand against the ways of this world, and it would have consequences. He knew that if God did not work in a supernatural way in his life, there would be a cost. And if you want to, I'd encourage you to even underline verse 9. That's the second time we see Daniel making progress because God had granted him. God is the one working on Daniel's behalf. Daniel comes up with this plan. He says, give us vegetables and water for 10 days. And so they do that. And at the end of the 10 days, they look healthier than everyone else. And they continue to agree to meet this specific need, this plan for the rest of the days under his command. Daniel refused to compromise and defile himself. He chose to be faithful to God alone, even when his king had lost faithfulness unto God. Even though they had been exiled, punishment, taken captive, besieged because of those choices, Daniel, in the midst of it, chose to remain faithful. He refused to compromise and defile himself. And he did so very thoughtfully. That was a plan. Ten days? That was a plan. And the Lord gave him favor to make the conversation even possible in the first place. And so sometimes we wait on the Lord to show us what to do and fail to realize that he's the one that's brought us to where we are. Yep. We're looking at the circumstance from the wrong way. The book of Daniel is going to allow us to see that the God who put you where you are is faithful in doing that. It's no accident. He's faithful. And if you'll trust him, you'll see him remain faithful to you again and again. And so chapter 1 of Daniel is clearly trying to emphasize God's role in this story for us to hold on to. God gave them what they needed for his purposes in Babylon. He removed all that they were comfortable with and all that had defined them and their service and their work before. And he gave them new ways, new methods to remain faithful to him. In the context in which they were. And every single one of these men. We get important roles. Important jobs of influence. In this kingdom. 
And like I said, Daniel was there for 70 years. He outlived multiple kings of Babylon, and he was even around when the Jews were released back to Jerusalem. Most historians believe that there's a good chance it was Daniel's influence on King Cyrus, his wisdom and uncompromising character that led Cyrus to release the Jews. That's God at work after 70 years of faithfulness. And so the main thing to take away from these verses that we read is also then to remain faithful to the Lord in all things. It might take 70 more years, but remain faithful. It might take seven more months or seven more weeks or seven more days or seven more hours or seven more minutes. We don't know, but remain faithful. Remain faithful and live out a life of uncompromised character that displays godly wisdom and godly fruit. Remain faithful. Daniel, though a foreigner in a strange land, never lost sight of the one true God. He resolved to remain faithful and trust in Yahweh. He understood that no amount of material possessions and earthly blessings could sustain and secure him. Only God was his refuge and his rock. C.S. Lewis wrote, He who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. Will you resolve to remain holy to God in all things? Will you run to him and his faithfulness for your life? there's a few things in chapter one I want you to notice today that show us what obedience to God looks like in the world in which we live. And the first is that to trust, to look for the faithfulness of God, to trust in his faithfulness and to look for his faithfulness. We saw throughout the text that we read today that God accomplished God's plan, that even though people had fallen from him and turned their backs on him, he still was faithful to reveal his heart for his people. Some of them were not all Daniels. Some of them had lived a life of compromise. Some of them were dreaming dreams and setting goals for themselves alone. They weren't God's plans. They had failed to trust in God, to repent and believe in him, but they had also failed to look for how he was faithful. They kept looking for other things, perhaps. The second thing that we can really remember today is that the Lord doesn't waste the pain that we face. We read how he worked by even scattering his people. Do you think that made God happy? To see his people turn their backs? Do you think that made him happy? To see that brokenness there? They failed to worship him correctly before. That's why they're here. But Daniel lived a life that said, not here, not now. He lived a life that said, I will live for God. In his book called The Message of Daniel, Gail Davis wrote that sometimes God may allow hardship to reach us because he wants his mercy to reach beyond us. He wants his mercy to reach beyond us. They were physically in a new geographical location in Babylon. The mercy and work of God was now on the move in a new and unique way. The book of Daniel is also a story about a missionary who didn't know he was a missionary. Preparing the ground for the work to come. God, move that person in your life to be in your influence so that you can share the gospel. So that you can live out God's truth. He brought a person, a family member, into your life so that you can show kindness and mercy instead of judgment and ridicule. So ask God, how do you want to use me today? When you meet someone new, you should have that, well, at some point, uh, when am I going to tell them about Jesus or talk to them about Jesus type of mindset like that? Because it's that important. And it's to remember also that no matter what you faced, any suffering, any hardship, it's not to be wasted. And the third thing we can take away from chapter one is to choose to live an uncompromised life of obedience to the Lord. Find something within your life to take a break from, to abstain from. Perhaps it's something physical, perhaps it's something spiritual, something emotional or mental. 
maybe foolish talk, corrupt talk, gossip even, or being a bystander to gossip or, or foolish talk. Because it's better to abstain from those type of things and keep in step with the Lord than to not do anything and keep in step with man. And I want to call you to join me in whatever that might be and take the next 10 days for God to choose something to abstain to abstain from, to say no to for the next 10 days and to see what God does in your life. Whatever that physical thing is, whatever that spiritual or emotional thing is, is to say no to it for the next 10 days and to see what God does in your life. Because for his whole life, Daniel was that stranger in a foreign land. Writing to the church, to the Apostle Peter, uh, he says, You are now strangers in whatever land you live in. In 2 Peter 2, 11 through 12, he says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give God honor to God and he will judge this world. Augustine said, we abstain from that which will defile us, yet we do so in a way that will lead those around us to see the glory of God in us. Daniel and his companions are great reminders of how we can remain holy, even in times of distress, pain, and suffering. To end all wars is a true story of a group of allied prisoners in a Japanese labor camp during World War II. And in one of the scenes, the prisoners begin to discuss what they're going to do once the, world is, once the war is over. One of the soldiers says, I'm going to get married. Another one says they want to go back to school and become a teacher. But when they ask the colonel what he's going to do, he simply says, start preparing for the next war. We Christians are in a war against sin, the world, and the devil. And we experience something similar. When one war ends, another one rises to take its place. We never stop fighting against the temptation of sin, at least in this life. And God's people, regardless of their circumstances, have always been called to be holy. To love like Jesus loved. Even while in exile, God expected the people of Israel to be a set-apart nation. The advance of the church is not dependent on culture, on government, on polling data, etc. It's dependent on a promise made by Jesus in Caesarea Philippi that says the gates of hell will not overcome it. So when the culture says you're weird and you're strange and you're different, we don't need to run away. We don't need to rattle our fists. We need to say yes and we need to believe in something even crazier. We need to believe that the God who said uh, we will go and do those greater things in his name actually means what he said. We actually are going to live a life that says we know that this guy who died on the cross, who rose from the grave, is coming again. We have to be ready to be able to say, behold, the Lamb of God has come. Because we don't need to withdraw while we wait. We don't need to retreat. And we don't need to vent out our rage. We need to say, onward, Christian strangers. The best is yet to come. As long as we choose to dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be God's best. Hebrews 11.33 reminds us to glance at the example of men like Daniel and their faith. But we must not stop there at their example. Hebrews 12 goes on and says we must turn our eyes to the greater Daniel and gaze upon him. We must fix our eyes on Jesus, who, though righteous, experienced the ultimate exile on the cross because of our sin. He was forsaken to bring us in and abandoned so that God might welcome us. Only by trusting and treasuring him can we be holy in our times of suffering and exile. And only by trusting and treasuring him can we dare to be like Daniel. Who will you serve? Who will you live for? You must choose to live an uncompromised, obedient life before God. You have to remember that no matter what you face, no matter what hardship you come across, that the Lord will not waste that pain as you look to and trust in his faithfulness. So remain faithful to him in all things. Understand that his sovereign work is at hand, even in your suffering. 
and that God desires for you to understand that through the fire and the lions, he is faithful. And that he desires for us to know what it means to live with conviction in a culture of compromise. In a world in which we're surrounded that is opposed to God. Because the world is watching. And you are God's chosen, his beloved. And it's time to live like we belong to him. In a world that says he's not that important. So who will you live for? Will you look to God alone? Will you seek him alone with all your life? Will you be faithful to God alone? Will you remember what he's brought you through? And where he has you? And will you remain resolved to seek his holy ways in all that you do? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the chance that we have to seek your truth and your love for our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the way in which you are at work in every circumstance, in every situation of our lives. Help us, Father, to understand your heart for us and your heart for your church and your heart for truth. Help us, Lord, not to grow weary or tired of seeking your goodness in our lives in a world in which we live that seems to live a way that's opposite of you. But rather, God, help us to understand how you've called us to live in the present moment, reflecting your goodness and your truth and your life. Help us, Lord, not to miss a moment in which we can bring you glory and fame sharing your gospel, your message of redemption and restoration. For God, those hearts that are hard, those hearts that are opposite of you, we pray, Lord, that you would work in their lives, that you would use unique experiences and circumstances to draw them close to you, and that, God, we would be your people, called by your name, seeking to glorify you in all that we say and in all that we do. We love you, Father, and it's in your name.